Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're really glad to have you all with us tonight here in person as well as online uh, for tonight's important discussion about Syria. Uh, tonight's panel is going to be moderated uh, by one of the star professors here at the Kennedy School, Nick Burns. Nick is the head of the Future of Diplomacy Project, and he's also a professor of the practice of diplomacy and international politics at the Kennedy School. And I always like to add, because Graham Allison says this, and Graham says that it must be true, Nick is widely regarded as the finest U.S. diplomat of his generation, and we're really glad to have him not only at the Kennedy School, but with us this evening. Nick. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, and thanks for sticking it out to uh, 7.22 p.m. We are looking forward to a good hour of discussion here. Uh, what we plan to do, and I'll introduce my colleagues in a minute, is just talk about this wrenching crisis in Syria, the Syria civil war. We'll do that for about 30 minutes. I want to ask the panelists a series of questions, and then we'll throw it to you. Uh, we'll ask you to step up to the microphones and you see where they are. And just uh, name and uh, what you're studying here at Harvard if you're a student and your question, and we'll do our best to answer it. We're really lucky to have three outstanding individuals who know a lot about this region with us tonight. To my left is a good friend, uh, Farah Pandit. Farah is the 2014 Institute of Politics resident fellow, so she's been here at Harvard uh, as a fellow. She's participating in classes. She's speaking to students. She's running study groups. She's an extraordinary person. She's a graduate of Smith College here in Massachusetts. She's just been honored by Smith. For the last uh, decade or so, Farah has worked for President George W. Bush and President Obama, for Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Secretary of State John Kerry, and she's been our the United States Special Representative to the Muslim communities at the Department of State. She's been the key person trying to think through how do we reach out and connect as a country, as a government, as a people to the Arab world and the Muslim world beyond it, uh, one-seventh of humanity. And that's a big job. You can imagine the challenges, but you can also imagine the opportunities, and Farah has been doing that, and we're really proud to have her at, at Harvard. Elliot Abrams is in the middle here. Uh, Elliot is a friend of both Farah and myself. We were all colleagues in the George W. Bush administration, and it was a pleasure to work with Elliot. He's now a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in the Washington office, I believe. Uh, he was deputy assistant to President Bush and deputy national security advisor. He was the senior official in the White House dealing with the Middle East during this incredibly tumultuous time after 9-11 uh, and into Iraq, dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Elliot and I worked together on the Iran question. We both worked on that. Many, probably hundreds of hours of meetings on that. And he's a recognized expert on the Middle East, long history in government going back many administrations, and a public intellectual in the United States. And finally, but not last, Afshalom Abu Vilan, who is also a visiting fellow at the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School in spring 2014. He's an interesting man, co-founder of Peace Now, the Israeli peace movement, president of the Israeli Farmer Federation, member of the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament between 1999 and 2009. We're lucky to have him here because all the Middle East is being affected by the crisis in Syria. Israel's being affected. So we wanted to get his voice and his perspective tonight. I would just set up the conversation. I'll ask four or five questions of our panelists by saying this. Think about what's happened in the last three and a half years since Tahrir Square, since we began to see, I think it was in southwest Syria, protests in certain villages. They began peacefully uh, in Tahrir Square, certainly in Tunisia and Libya and Syria. Think of the hope that many Arabs have, millions of Arabs, that the Middle East might be transformed because of a student youth-led rebellion called the Arab Spring at, at the beginning of 2011. And then fast forward and think about that hope to the present day. 22 Arab states, you can probably only make the argument that two of them, Morocco and Tunisia, might be marginally better off. Everybody else has slid backward. Egypt, certainly. Iraq, certainly. Syria, definitely. Here are the numbers on Syria that I want to discuss tonight. There are 22.4 million Syrians in the country. At least 9.3 million of them are now refugees, either in Lebanon or in Turkey or in Iraq 
or in Jordan or elsewhere. The majority of them are refugees in their own country. So we would technically, in the international system, call them displaced persons, the refugees. They've lost their homes, they've lost their jobs, their kids can't go to school, they're on the run. They're on the run from Assad's cynical and brutal barrel bombing of Syrian towns and villages. He'd been doing that for three years. They're on the run from some of these jihadi terrorist groups, rebel groups, who are also shooting at these civilians. At least 150,000 people dead. There is no other country in the world today with as high a percentage of its population, refugees, in their own country, in their re own region. This is a humanitarian catastrophe and a civil war that won't quit because Assad just seems just strong enough to survive. The rebel groups disunited, divisive, fighting among each other, not strong enough to win. So you have to assume the civil war is going to continue and where are we going to be? And here's the big question for our panel tonight. A year from now, mm -hmm. if there's 12 million refugees and 200,000 dead, shouldn't we do something on a humanitarian basis? We think about our responsibilities to poor, pe afflicted people. So that's what we want to discuss. That's the context. Here's my first question. And maybe we'll just, Farah, start with you and go to Elliot and go to Abu. Um, there's a stalemate in the Civil War. Should, what should the United States government do? Should President Obama arm the moderate rebel groups? Are there moderate rebel groups to arm? Would that help to drive Assad, to drive up the cost to him and to force him into a ceasefire? Or would it, is President Obama right that there's really nobody that we can support responsibly, therefore we should stand off and do nothing. We do know from a lot of press reports that there was a very vigorous debate at the end of President Obama's first term, and it appeared that senior members of the American cabinet wanted to arm the rebels, and President Obama chose not to. So what do we do in the largest dimension, Farah, of this crisis? So I absolutely uh, understand that two years into this, um, it's easy to sort of put our hands up now and say this is their thing. Still, this has been the argument. It's their, their issue. Let them sort it out. It's an internal thing. But two years later, we're looking at a not only a humanitarian crisis, but a recruitment crisis. And the implications, and I know we'll get into that, but the implications for our country and many countries around the world in terms of foreign fighters leaving their homeland and going to fight in Syria means that we're gonna be having to deal with this for a very long time. So the first answer is do something. And what's the something? I don't think we've analyzed uh, all the options on the table. I mean, I don't think it's just arm the rebels or help, uh, you know, putting it in a framework of, uh, uh, of sort of a, a military or non-military kind of thing. I think there's an ideological piece that we can get into. So I know that my colleagues will probably talk on the, on the harder side, but I'm looking at the softer side. What would I ask President Obama to do? I would ask President Obama to think really long and hard about what we can do using 21st century statecraft in the ideological space, to be blasting out um, counter messages to the message of extremism so that we are beginning to stop the bleeding of foreign fighters that are, that are coming in. So that's the first point. That's, that is an easy, in my view, far easier uh, thing to begin to do, working with uh, a, a context of thinking about how the images of the humanitarian crisis are impacting a person in terms of radicalizing them, working in the refugee camps themselves on education, on counter narratives to the narrative of extremism. Those are things we can do now. That doesn't require uh, tanks, that doesn't require um, uh, you know, vast m movements of people. It requires ingenuity in terms right. of how we think through things. Thank you, and we'll come back to this yep. issue, Farah, because I know that you've thought a lot deeply about it. Elliot, what's your take? What should the U.S. do? <clears throat> well, I think the President was right um, when he said Assad has to go, which he said several times. And <clears throat> I think it should still be the policy of the United States to try to force him out, because I don't think Syria gets better under him. You know, it's a 75% Sunni country. The only way Assad is ever going to be able to rule that country is by brute force. So I think he does have to go. And I think we should be attempting to uh, arm non-jihadi rebel groups. Most of the jihadis are foreigners. Largest single group is Iraqis, there are Saudis, there are people from everywhere. I'm talking about Syrians. Um, now I can't tell you for certain that that's possible. You know, I don't see the intelligence. I'm not there in the field. 
Um, but I believe there are many, and I'm told by people who do see it, in many cases, the Syrians who have gone with the jihadi groups have done so because those groups have money and guns. If you want to fight Assad, that's where you go. And one of the, you know, one of the reasons is because they've gotten some of it from uh, Gulf Arab governments. And one of the reasons is that we have not given the adequate resources to non-jihadi Syrian rebel groups. So I would go back to that. I think that when Sergei Clinton and Secretary Panetta recommended that, they were right. And the president was wrong to reject their advice. So I, I, that is, it seems to me, still the path we need to take to change the government of Syria. Okay, thank you, Elliot. Abu, what do you think? I mean, you're, you live next door, you share a border, you have a disputatious history and have had for 66 years with the Syrians. How do you see this from an Israeli perspective? First of all, it's uh, good evening. It's quite difficult for me to give suggestions to the American what to do. But in Israeli perspective, I think that the dilemma is uh, to choose between the worst and the most worst. Because uh, the situation is, on the one hand, Assad is uh, going to Fyodor with the Iranians for many years already. And now the Russian came into um, the region again. And if you will support America, for instance, will support the revolutionaries, so immediately the Russian will support back the military forces. Now, and it's true that it, it really t a very great strategy that you see that they are killing every day hundreds and thousands of innocent people, both sides. And if you check what happened in the Middle East in the last 100 years, that in the beginning of the 20th century, um, the world divided then, uh, Great Britain, France, and other divided the region to some kind of artificial uh, state. And you see the problem in Iraq today, that you have Shia, Sunni, and Kurds. And you see it in Syria, that 75% are Sunni, and the others are Lawa. Mm -hmm. And you see Lebanon with the Christian and the Muslim and all others. And you see that in all these three places, that for years now, there are all kinds of a very bitter civil war. So if you ask me from Israeli perspective, I think that uh, on the one hand, we prefer that, uh, let's say, if today the extremists keep the common border, 70%, 75% the common border between Israel and Syria today uh, is in the influence of the um, Al-Qaeda and other group forces over there. So this make our life quite impossible because they started now very slow in uh, some kind of terrorist activity and we can have a problem. I think, I'll say just one thing about the United States. I think that in the past, we all, United States and Israel, we lost an opportunity. When was that? In the beginning of the year 2000, and maybe a few years later on, Assad went to Iran because he didn't have any other alternative after he uh, lost, lost the Soviet Union. And I think that in that period... You're, you're talking about Hafez al-Assad, the yeah, father Hafez, of the Assad the president. father, yeah. yeah. If at that period America will allow him to get out from the list of terror and to try to connect him to the Western world, maybe then it can change the all geo geopolitical situation in the region. In this very moment, the Assad is totally dependent on the Iranians and the Russians, and the alternative is, as I said before, worse. So what I am very pessimistic because I see that they will continue in this struggle for year two, three, who knows. And in this very moment, I don't see any solution, and it's really, a really strategy. Thank you. One of the great you know, unknown questions of history will be what would have happened had Yitzhak Rabin survived. Uh, I was uh, spokesperson of the State Department in 95 and accompanying Secretary of State Christopher on shuttles between Jerusalem and Damascus, and there was a feeling that the Israelis and Syrians were close to a peace agreement in 1995, and we tried. But after Rabin's assassination, it all fell apart. I don't
don't know. As Asad father was a tough character, cynical. Be brutal. honest with you, very short. Asad father told President Clinton that Rabin suggested him a peace agreement in '95, but he was assassinated. In '96, Perez suggests the same deal, but then Perez asked, "Give there will be election? Wait till after the election." Mm -hmm. And Perez lose, lose. And then Netanyahu suggested, and he lost to Barack. Barack put this proposal on the table, and in the last moment he decided that to wait. So from Assad, the father point of view, he said four times the Israelis put a proposal on the table, and nothing happened. So it's really missing. I'm definitely sure. Um, let me ask this question. You've all spoken. You've all given your point of view. There seems to be two roads here for the United States and President Obama. One road would be the road that he's on. The president says, and I think we have to listen carefully, obviously, that we can't fight everyone's battles. We're just coming out of two big land wars. We have budgetary problems. Um, we want to fight winnable wars. This is not, I'm just channeling, trying to interpret mm -hmm. what I hear from the administration. This is not a win winnable war. It would take several hundred thousand American troops to defeat Assad, and therefore the proper alternative is to have Secretary of State Kerry try to negotiate an end of the war. Geneva one, Geneva two, the negotiations headed by Lakhar Brahimi, they've both rounds have failed, but they think that's the better alternative, ceasefire political transition, if you can get it. The counter argument would be that's the wrong road. There are people, and I want to ask each of you whether which road you'd advise the president to walk down. The counter argument would be you can't have a ceasefire and political transition because Iran, Hezbollah, and Assad will block it. They'll block that road. And that um, uh, we can't have a political settlement, especially after Putin's invasion of Crimea when trust has been eroded between the United States and Russia, that we ought to go back to the original proposals and we should become an actor, arm the moderate rebels, finance them, work with the Saudis, Emiratis, Qataris, and Turks to do that, drive up the cost to Assad, and try to see if you can strengthen the rebel alliance and therefore win a tactical series of military victories. Those appear to be the two roads that are being debated in Washington, the two paths, which road should the president walk down? Let me, let me just say, the one thing the president should not do is to speak disingenuously about this, as he did on NBC in the last week. He did an interview with Scott Pelley. And Scott CBS. Pelley, uh, CBS, sorry. Yeah. And Scott Pelley said to him, um, do you have doubts about your decision last September not to strike after the use of chemical weapons? And the president said, um, no, um, our troops are tired after 10 years of war. Nobody is talking about troops in Syria. Nobody's talking about invading Syria. You can argue for or against what the president decided in September. You can argue for or against what I propose, you know, of, of, of uh, covert action, basically, supporting the rebels. I don't, uh, but I think it's disingenuous to say that those of us who argue as Kerry and, uh, excuse me, uh, Clinton and Panetta did, but Kerry also said he agreed with them when he became secretary. They argued for doing a little more on the covert side. Kerry argued, of course, for this airstrike. You can't really look Kerry, Clinton, Panetta, all of us in the face and say, this is another Iraq. There will be 100,000 American troops on the ground. The choice for an American president cannot, and the American people, I think, cannot be put as either we do nothing or it's Iraq again. I, if that's the way we feel about this, we are really going to diminish ourselves as a world power and our ability to do anything in the world because there, are, there is a big spectrum and it's disingenuous to say, no, there isn't. It's nothing or it's war. So can I just press this point a little bit? So you would argue, Elliot, I, I'm just reading between the lines, for a strategy of armed rebels, try to find people you can support who are not jihadi groups, uh, and see if you can drive up the cost to Assad. Is that part of what you think we should do? Yes, uh, I, I, I'm confident we can drive up the cost. The question would be whether we can drive it up enough. Um, and again, I'm not certain I know the answer to that. But there's another angle here we do have to consider, which is what's on the other side? It's not Assad, it's Assad, Hezbollah, Iran and Putin. And what they're basically saying is, we're willing to invest some money here. 
um, and uh, we're willing to win. And it's a very big decision for the United States to say, well, in that case, the truth sanctions for us, we're not willing to win. You guys can win. That will have ramifications, of course, not only in Syria, but also in Lebanon, and also in Iraq, and also in Iran, and also maybe in Ukraine. Because I would argue that Putin's decision to go and take Crimea is partly related to that decision on Syria last September. The decision when Not the president drew the red line on chemical weapons. And, and didn't act. Do you think it had consequences? I think it has a lot of consequences, and among them are just saying to the Russians and Iranians, um, the Americans are, 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 are gun shy. Um, and that's a, bad, that's a bad thing, I think. And now, to be fair, just to President Obama, for one moment, um, you and I worked for a very tough Marshall president George W. Bush, Putin went into Georgia in August 2008, uh, and he went in despite the fact that he knew that President Bush was a tough-minded individual. So I wonder if, if you can really draw that link to Ukraine. At least you, can, you have to argue that point. Right. No, I, I agree. Um, the, the mistake we made in the case of, you, of um, Georgia, I think, was um, there was no price, or not a serious pri price imposed. There were some sanctions, not very big. And frankly, then the Obama administration removed those that had existed. So in the recess. Yeah, yeah, so I think the lesson that Putin took from the Georgia experience under two presidents and the Syria experience under one president is the Americans, and, and this is not just Obama, this is the Americans. This is the American people. Both political parties. The Congress. Uh, the Americans are war weary. I can get away with a lot now. Uh, now he may be right, by the way, with respect to the American people, and that's another question worth looking well, at. Abu, can I turn to you in this, and, and we'll come back to Farah. This is a question about credibility. Uh, so the, the, the charge against the President that Elliot has just put forward, but a lot of other people have put it forward, uh, is that by drawing a line in the sand on chemical weapons, and then when Assad crossed it, the President then didn't respond after having threatened he would. In the psychology of the Middle East, of the Arab world, does that diminish the credibility of the United States? Being honest and open with you, I think that the, the problem started a little bit before. And I think that in the chemical weapon case, I think that the American response to more or less was all right. And I think that the solution, it's okay. But the main problem started before, the understanding of the Middle East by the Americans, and it didn't start with this administration. I'll give you two examples. Uh, First of all, when uh, the Bush administration decided to make this uh, military operation in Iraq without thinking about any kind of exit strategy or what is going to happen to the American forces in the long run, it's all, I don't, we, we, there were a few Israeli experts who came here mm -hmm. and explained all the scenarios, what can happen, and people, the, the decision makers over here didn't even thought that it, it's not a problem. Uh, you, it's very easy from military point of view to conquer Iraq, but later on start the real problem and nobody thought about it, how to get out by all means. Now, the second point is what happened in the Arab Spring. This yeah. Arab Spring became an Arab winter by all means. Now, what happened, for example, in Egypt? And the American, in my opinion, did few mistakes because if you want to solve the problem of Syria, you need Turkey, you need Egypt, and you need Saudi Arabia. And you need some kind of alias that all together you can do something. Now, and I think that there is some naive belief in the Western world that think that, you know, if there will be democracy, so we can solve the issue. And it's not. I think that Thomas Friedman was right when he wrote in uh, his book, The World is Flat, that the alternative in the, our world today is between secular regimes with all the problem of corruption whatsoever and the fundamentalists. And look what happened now. We all believe that there will be a spring and immediately in all such kind of places, the fundamentalists took the power or you have some kind of a civil war that is a real disaster, meaning that if you want to build some kind of framework, some kind of forces, it means that you have to think long run thinking and uh, and to try to build a situation 
that somebody that will support America will, good, will do a good deal. The, the losing of credibility, what's happened in the last two years, it's, it's, not, it's from Iraq's writing. Uh, so it's not just a phenomenon you can put on President Obama. No, it no, started it's not long before that. I don't think that question of President Obama, President and Bush. I think that it's some kind of a process that for the Middle East is very important that all states in the region will understand that America is America. Hmm. Because in the end of the day, with all the problems and with all the mistakes, don't forget that America is still America. But in the meantime, we are paying some heavy prices because there are a few elements who want to uh, limit the sun. Thank you. So Sarah. But the thing I'd say is in 2014, um, we're not in a vacuum. Um, what's happening in the Middle East, whether you call it the Arab Spring or the Arab Winter, it's extremism. Okay? It is extremism. It is a region filled with pockets of crazy things that are happening across borders that we didn't know before. So Syria happens, you're in the Oval, you have to understand a couple of things. One, Syria means something to Muslims. It is a historic theological place. A bell should go off, that's important. We ha what have we learned since 9-11? How are we thinking about how people were recruited in Afghanistan in the 1980s? The number of people that are going to Syria out far out surpass mm. the foreign fighters that were in Afghanistan. That is a major problem for our country and the Western world in general for decades. We are going to have to deal with this, whether we're arming the rebels or we're doing some sort of formal negotiation. This is a problem that has already been unleashed. So as I think about this, this is not just the same, this is not Iraq, this is absolutely not Iraq in any way, shape, or form. There's a theological component to Syria that did not exist in Iraq. There is an imagery issue along the humanitarian piece that did not exist. So this is, um, to me, as I think about how we would advise the president, really this way or this way, it better be one way or another quickly, <laughs> and we better figure out how to stop the bleeding on the extremist recruitment. I mean, because that's not gonna go away. So Sarah, let's follow up with you on this, because yeah. you know a lot about this. You were focused on this for many years. Um, how uh, effective has the recruitment process been? Where are people being recruited from? North America, Western Europe, as well as the Arab world yeah. and the Far East? So in terms of the recruitment, you would think it was just gonna be the local players that people are going over borders and, and going in. And now why everybody's terrified is because we have a recruitment that's happening even in the United States. We have France, we have UK, we have Germany, we have the Nordics, we have Belgium, we have the Netherlands, not to speak of South Asia, not to speak mm. of Africa. Um, there are uh, some reports uh, more than 57 nations of people who are coming forward. That to is a fight to a fight. Jihad in Let me tell you something else. The number of people under the age of 18 in the refugee camps are gigantic. And if you were a bad guy and you were trying to get recruits, where would you go? You know, now put on top of that 21st century awareness, right? We are looking at YouTube, Twitter, real time, every day, people who have been recruited telling their stories, showing images. And that is gonna be consistent. Even people who have died have Twitter accounts that are still, that are still um, their followers who are still reading what those, what those folks have said about the beauty of being a jihadi. This is a serious problem. So it isn't if the war ends tomorrow, you know, we're all fine. It's what's happened emotionally to a generation of young people that is going to, God forbid, impact us in ways that we haven't thought about. Not to speak, Nick, of folks that are leaving Syria, disenchanted, coming back to their homelands who right. now have an ha ha they're ra radicalized, they're emotional, they're angry, they know how to make bombs, they have a network, and they're back home. So this leads, uh, I'm watching the clock, I wanna bring you all in to ask questions. Um, maybe two more questions, maybe one, two, Elliot Nabu and one Sarah to you. The question for both of you is, we've been arguing about what are the national security reasons why we might want to intervene more aggressively, were we right not to intervene before. It seems to me there's a humanitarian imperative here too. If these refugee numbers and the number of dead continue to rise, we have to begin to answer an ethical, moral question. Um, shouldn't we, the international community, do something to stop this softening? It's, you know, Bill Clinton continues to say publicly, to his credit, 
that his, his, the, the most serious mistake he made as president was not intervening in Rwanda when at least 800,000 people died in the genocide in, in the spring and summer of 1994. We know we were at least two or three years too late getting to Bosnia. Yeah. We got to Bosnia. We stopped the war in 95, but after a quarter of a million people had, had died and several million had become homeless. So these awesome numbers, these terrible numbers, nine million refugees, 150,000 dead, is there a humanitarian and moral imperative for the international community to say, we've got to do something effective to stop this fighting? Do you, are we there I yet? When do we get well, there? Well, we ought to be there. I mean, um, I think if you had said to any of us, or the president, or the Congress, or any of you, a few years ago, um, now there's 1,000 people dead in Syria, and there's 50,000 homeless. Do you think we should do more if it gets to be 150,000 dead and six million, uh, nine I think million. everybody, nine million up here, yeah. I think we all would have said, well, sure, we can't permit that. We have permitted um, it. Now, we have happened. permitted it. We have permitted it. And I mean, you, you, I would add to your list Darfur, which happened in yep. the Bush administration, yep. where we didn't do as much as we might have done either. The problem, of course, is then what do you do? We've been reasonably generous, I think, as a country in coming up with money yep. uh, for the UN High Commission for Refugees and so forth. Where we've not been generous is on taking Syrian refugees. We've, you know, we've taken a few, but really not many. And we have these laws. I actually have an op-ed on this in yesterday's USA Today, and I'm sure all of you read USA Today <laughs> every day, so you will have seen it. Um, we have laws that say things like, um, well, if you gave support, any kind of even insignificant support to a rebel group, a terrorist group, of course, we're not going to admit you. Well, you know, what? In, in the case of Syria, very often this is compelled by these groups. It's not voluntary. Uh, so our rules are much too strict and our numbers are much too low and we're not going to be able to persuade others. Um, we should be working with you know, the EU, Canada, Australia, other potential havens. It's still not the solution. We're not going to take nine million people. Um, but then you know, we come full circle, which is how do you stop this? I think we've seen that the Geneva talks did not succeed in doing this. And I've reached the point, and I acknowledge, you know, I certainly can't prove this, but I've reached the point where it seems to me uh, either the Iranian Hezbollah Assad side is going to win this, or they're going to lose and he's going to have to leave, and I think that's the only way you're ever going to get stability. I don't think you're going to get any kind of stability or any kind of just government in Syria with him in power. So you think his well, regime has to change in order to for stability? To solve the fundamental problem. Yeah. Just as we had, to get rid of, we had to get rid of the Taliban. Remember, in 2000, the great refugee problem in the world was the Afghan rebels. Uh, excuse me, Afghan refugees. But once we got rid of the Taliban, those people went home. There is no Afghan refugee problem now. I think we should do that in Syria. Abu, what do you think? Is there a moral humanitarian imperative to As act? As a human being, I, I really pray, uh, not to religious, but I really pray that we can find a solution that because it, it, it's a real genocide by all means, and it's terrible. But having said that, you just mentioned Afghanistan. One of the main problems now that all these terrorist groups, forces whatsoever, transferred the last two years from Afghanistan to Syria. And this Syria is today become the new Afghanistan. Is one of the main problems. I don't see in this very moment a solution on the ground that America can intervene and find something. This is the, the tragedy of the situation. But furthermore, maybe stability will be if Syria will be developed, uh, it will be divided into two different states. It can happen hmm. that Dalawi in the north or near the beach will have their own uh, and the Kurds. Yeah, <laughs> and the Kurds, yeah. And the uh, Sons will have other parts, but it's it's now, you know, it's one of the possibility to finish this crisis, but it still will take time, and in the short run, I, I really uh, think that it's a terrible situation. And the problem in this very moment is that both sides are still eager to continue. Mm. And you can get into a situation that both sides are really weak and won't to look for some kind of a hope. In this very moment, both sides don't look for any hope, and that's the reason that some, but some power which comes from outside, it's very difficult to do something. Thank you. Claire, I want to give you the last word, then we're going to go to questions. So um, 
if you want to ask a question, uh, you can line up in a minute at these microphones. Um, in the long term, we don't know how the drama ends, if this terrible war ends, but um, there's a possibility of a wider regional conflict, mm -hmm. given Syria's location. There's a possibility that in the hearts and minds of young Arabs and young Muslims, this war could propel radicalization. How much do you worry about those two scenarios? So this narrative is, has universal appeal. That is one thing we need to understand. Um, this isn't just a regional thing that people feel compelled to do. This has a universal component to it because of the question of humanitarian um, imagery that is out there. As a human, people want to react. They want to do something. They are seeing the suffering. And so uh, I do wonder. I wonder a lot about uh, how what the implications are going to be in the long term. And the other thing is in terms of the narrative. The narrative of the extremists is both a near and a far enemy. The near enemy is Assad. Let's get rid of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we want him out. Well, what's the far enemy? The far enemy is the Western world. Look, the West didn't do anything to help all these, these refugees. They didn't do anything to help all these humanitarians. Aren't you going to come over to our side now and be part of that? That's how these narratives are built. Mm. So it is not a question of you know, uh, short-term, you know, quick action. I am really worried about this because of what I said earlier. Mm -hmm. You're seeing a fundamental change in the kind of recruitment that's happening, because it's social, it's, it's happening very quickly, it's real time. You have a young population, both in the camps and people who are going over. You have, now we're seeing countries that had never seen foreign fighters coming into the region, coming in, what is the long-term impact for that as well? And again, the final point is, um, if you're thinking about domestic, the domestic side, the homeland, our homeland, and, and, and a stable and safe place, um, how can you know what the implications are gonna be, and so therefore, how do you defend it? Okay. Thanks to all three of you for very thoughtful answers. Let's go to this microphone first, then we'll go to the two in the balcony, then we'll go to you, sir. Please. <coughs> Thank you for your time and uh, for sharing some insight. Uh, just, I, I really appreciated some of the specific responses we had towards what the international community or particularly the United States could take in terms of actionable responses, but I'm, I'm still wary that those are really gonna be effective. And I say that particularly because of the recent experience in the international community with, uh, with regard to Libya. I think whereas for a while it's supposed to be held as a model of R2P, I think that uh, there's been a lot more backlash from that as we get more information on um, Gaddafi's actions before it and the destabilization in Libya following it. So I wonder how much is that affecting the international community's willingness or even ability? And even more specifically, what would an international response look like that would be different than what we saw in Libya? So what happened? Did what happened in Libya now have an impact mm -hmm. on how countries are thinking about their options in Syria? I, I That's think part of the question. Maybe so. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely affected the response. I think the question is, mm. how would those events shape a future response if there were to be one? In Thank you Syria? very much. Um, Libya, I think, is a wonderful example. Wonderful, <laughs> very bad example about exactly what has happened there. There was a revolution there, but now the the, the war between the the tribes is continue and there is no stability at all. Meaning this is a, 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 a good example that uh, the, the international community decided to interfere and to try to help one side. But in the moment that's gone, nothing happened on the ground and the civil war is continuing. So this is a real crash. Alex? I, I, of course, it's not the same as Syria in the Absolutely. sense that that was a NATO led intervention, it's UN authorized. Yeah, but I think it does have one significant impact. I think one of the reasons that there was so much support, I think it was about 78% if I remember, for the President's decision not to intervene in Syria, is the sense that um, it's hopeless. The sense that, you know, look, 6,000 dead, trillion dollars in Iraq, look at the place, it's a mess. We intervened in Libya, okay, UN, NATO, it's a mess. Uh, none of these things work. It's a kind of sense of pessimism that anything we can do will do anything but cost money, cost lives, not improve the situation. Thank you very much. Here. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Max. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, I want to ask a question that was, I think, similar to the second to last question asked about ethical imperatives um, and sort of how you factor human rights into the decision making, because especially in light of you know, the situation in Rwanda in the 90s and, and in the DRC and in that region, which is you know, the deadliest conflict since World War II. 
Um, and you mentioned Darfur as well. In those places, the United States hasn't done that much, which I guess, for those of us who haven't ever been in government like myself, makes me wonder what kind of role uh, those factors, like human rights, just very purely, in the, most, in the purest sense, human rights, what, how much that factors in uh, in foreign policy and defense strategy. So my question, maybe for all, of, for all of you who have been in government, is how much do you think the president can and might consider human rights um, and sort of the more moral argument rather than the strategic argument in making decisions about this issue? Right, and I just add to your question, which I think I'm going to direct to Elliot first, um, that the United States government, President Bush, supported responsibility to protect at the September 2005 UN Reform Summit. And indeed, without having that concept in mind, President Clinton intervened twice in the Balkans, largely on humanitarian grounds. So it's a very good question, Elliot. It's a very hard question. Um, I think every president does think about this um, for, for reasons of principle, um, for humanitarian personal reasons. Um, but um, you know, uh, uh, the U.S. government is not an NGO. We have lots of things we balance. Um, and one of the things the president also thinks about, every president, is um, what do the American people think and want? Now, I do think here it's fair to be critical of President Obama in comparison to President Clinton. Because I think if you look at the opinion polls on those interventions. Very unpopular. Very unpopular. Very unpopular. Really low. And President Clinton decided, I need, we need to do this and I will try to persuade the American people it's the right thing to do. And I think he largely succeeded in persuading people. Um, and, and President Obama, different, very different moment in history, of course, decided um, maybe I'm not gonna be able to persuade the American people who after Afghanistan and Iraq are unpersuadable for the moment. And maybe he decided, you know, this is not Europe. And maybe he decided I'm not going to be able to do anything, Libya in a sense, I'm not going to be able to do anything really useful here. And you know, any president is weighing all of that. I think we could have done more in Rwanda. I think we could have done more in Darfur. I, I think those are easier cases actually than Syria. Um, but every president I think you know, wrestles with this from the point of view of principle, national security interests, and also politics. Sir, if I can ask you, you're one of the few people who have worked at a high level for both the last two presidents. In your experience, how much do these factors of morality, ethics, doing the right thing, how do these presidents balance them against concrete national interests? This, this dilemma between ideals and self-interest that we've had throughout American history, really. Well, I, I don't think I can say it any better than, than Elliot um, has, but I, I will say this. I mean, I think the, the folks that are around the president able to make a case and, and make it well, have, have a, a really special um, opportunity to persuade. And the things that I've seen, I mean, obviously, as Elliot, sometimes there's a, there's a crisis, there's, a, there's a, a, a another need that has to happen. As much as you want to do something else, something else weighs harder. But I have seen cases in which that other thing was really, really serious, and, and mm -hmm. but the tipping point came when a well-structured argument, a complete uh, understanding, a complete discourse persuaded the national security advisor and the president that in fact, this is the direction we needed to go. Mm. Um, that also obviously was the case with, um, with the various secretaries. If you can manage to find a non, you, you can't use the em only the emotional. Mm -hmm. You have to connect it with other things that make sense and will persuade. The last thing I'd simply say, just because I, I know a lot of the students in my study group often are interested sort of in the behind the scenes things. Look, the NSC, as well as the State Department and any other department and agency, have players back and forth who are always arguing different things. That's how government works. And so th it isn't always um, easy to make your case, but if you can build a coalition where it's not just the State Department, for example, that's saying something, but if you get state and you get defense and maybe a lot of people at the NSC on your side that can make that case for the president, you're in a much better standing to have it succeed. That's a really important insight for our students and one of the reasons why at the Kennedy School, in my class and many others, we practice not the 20-page memo or the <laughs> 200, the two-page memo. Or we practice, can you make an effective presentation without notes in front of the president and argue a case analytically as well as emotionally and clearly. 
And these are skills we practice here because we know that's how yeah. decisions are made. They're really made in right in front of Barack Obama or Condoleezza Rice or Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for, for that. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Avi. I'm a freshman at the college like Max, and I wanted to thank all the speakers for a really informative debate. I wanted to touch on something that Mr. Abrams brought up. He said that Bashar Assad has to step down eventually at some point. That's kind of like one thing that is going to happen at some point. And I was wondering how um, or what role the international community can play intervening in Syria maybe after he steps down, because in the rebel faction, there is a terrorist organization, Al Nusra, that's involved, and Bashar Assad is part of an Alawite minority in the state, so I was wondering if the international community may need to step in or how they would do so. Thank, Thank you. you. Elliot, do you want to tackle that? Well, um, I thought from the very beginning, and said from the very beginning, um, we need to start organizing a UN force to go into Syria. Now, of course, that made a lot of sense a couple of years ago. The level of violence was pretty low, and the idea was, well, you can help separate the groups, and, and that would probably work much, much harder now. So much death and destruction. But I think if you imagine somehow you could wave a magic wand, wand and, and Assad leaves, and um, I would still think about that question of, of a UN force um, to separate groups, to protect groups, to protect the Alawite minority. Um, I, I don't know there are going to be ma very many volunteers, though. That's another problem. People like to volunteer for peacekeeping. Fighting to keep groups apart is, is a lot harder. And Elliot, a further complication is the fact that the United States and Russia both hold the veto in the Security Council, and we tend to be vetoing each other. And in light of Crimea yeah. and the poisonous relations between the White House and the Kremlin, can you see the Russians agreeing to a UN force? I can't today. If you posit a situation where Assad is gone or leaving, then uh, I think it's plausible that the Russians would cut their want a hand in that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. I want to go back to some of the early comments that were made about perhaps arming the Syrian rebels without right. the, the foreigners. I don't think, Mr. Abrams, you were involved in Operation Cyclone, but that's where we armed the Mujahideen in Pakistan, even though Bhutto said that we're going to create a Frankenstein. And I think many people, well, I don't trace those arms to 9-11, many people do agree that those arms went to the Taliban and perhaps are even being seen in Syria now. I'm wondering, even if we let the Mossad vet <laughs> the recipients of the arms, how do we know that it would stay with those people and not really uh, turn to the Islamists? Uh, Abu, do you want to Let's get the Mossad into this. Yeah. Take a swing at this. First of all, and uh, I can't speak about the Mossad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, what, what I can say that, you know, the former head of the Mossad will be here next Tuesday, and he's talking here in the forum, so you can ask him this question. But seriously speaking now, uh, I think that uh, the, the problem with Syria, that nobody knows what can happen. And I don't, you know, even you, you ask, for example, the meaning of Crimea regarding Syria is different because... Crimea, it's for the Russian, it's important because historical reason, military one, and so ever. It's not the situation in Syria, although they get into it now, and it's a problem, but I think that if the world situation that America can intervene in, in Syria, I don't think that the Russian could have stopped them. I think that the, the situation on the ground between the rivals of all sides it's so complicated, so difficult, that I don't see in this very moment that somebody with very uh, good will will try to do something and will succeed by all means. Having said that, I still think that the human being, and what you asked uh, before uh, in politics, if there are any meaning to human rights with all kind of, I think that is the most important question. But in life, the real life, you have to choose between alternatives. And this is the problem, that all alternatives in Syria in this mm. very moment are really horrible. This is the problem. I think the other insight we have at the Kennedy School is that we look at a lot of critical national security decisions of the last 30 or 40 years. You rarely have <laughs> yeah. easy and hard. Yeah. It's almost a yeah. competition among yeah. really bad options yeah. as our presidents and Secretary of State face them. But let's get to this yes. question, Farah and Elliot. 
Is President Obama right that sometimes the best decisions are the ones you don't make? That if we arm these rebels, those weapons could end up being turned against us. I think his caution, isn't it well advised here? A cautious Well, attitude? we come back to this question. That's the point. How That's can we question. be sure? We can't be sure. We cannot be sure. We can do our best. You can be sure that whatever you're doing will not work perfectly well. Some percentage of the arms which you think you're giving to nationalist Syrian non-jihadis, uh, you'll guess wrong, or uh, guess is not right, you'll judge wrong. Um, in some cases, they'll lose the weapons, they'll sell the weapons, weapons will be stolen. Um, I don't think that can be, though, the fact that X percent will leak, in a sense. Um, the president's doing what, in the short run at least, the American people want him to do. Not, not get, get not involved, get involved in Syria further. Um, I'm just not sure from the humanitarian and strategic point of view that I don't think that's the right decision. I think that um, one of the reasons the jihadis have this playing field is um, there's really nobody else on that playing field saying to them, no, there's a Turkish, Jordanian, Saudi, Emirati, American side to this. Come join that side. Now how many would? Again, can I prove this to you? There's no possible way. It's a judgment. It may be wrong. And Sarah, from your perspective, you, you understand the undercurrent here and the human drama. If we stay outside and don't get involved, is there a risk or is the President's caution maybe in this case the right way? So I think that the, the risk that we take is back to the sort of the near and the far enemy mm -hmm. piece um, in terms of the narrative. The narrative is never going to go away. This is something that's going to keep coming up no matter what issue happens three years from now, five years from now, it's don't you remember when. We see this, uh, we see this unfold and a lot of, I mean, Bosnia is raised all the time. Um, when, you're, when you're looking at the texture and the quality of these arguments, they don't make any sense. They seem ridiculous to you or me. We're, we're rational, but when you are vulnerable, when you are emotional and you're seeing pictures of your fellow Muslims around the world who bad things are happening to, and then you start saying, look, it happened here, and it happened here, and it happened here. It means Syria is the last here. So we have to do something. It isn't going to go away. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for this open talk. Uh, my name is Kusai. I recently came from Syria almost three weeks ago. I survived the chemical attack on 21-8 by the Assad regime, and also the starvation weapon that they used on our small town keep it start for almost 50 months. Uh, I just want to add one simple line for this talk, that the problem in Syria is we started demonstrating peacefully for eight months against the dictator, and after the whole world failed to protect the peaceful demonstrations, people had uh, were forced to raise arms to defend themselves, and that caused more uh, complications to the issue. Bashar al-Assad stated loud and clear on international TV that he's going to turn Syria into a new Afghanistan if anybody tried to get him out of power. And this is what he did, apparently. So uh, we have the Free Syrian Army who is fighting right now both of the Assad regime and the Iraqis and Hezbollah militias and uh, ISIS as well. And until now, the longer the United States is waiting to make actions, the more the things is getting more complicated in Syria. So uh, my simple question is for how long the United States will wait until they start making actions. Uh, we have the biggest humanitarian crisis in the 21st century, maybe since World War II mm -hmm. as well. And it's all because of one lunatic have access on power, which is Bashar al-Assad. I believe taking down Bashar al-Assad will solve, will solve uh, the biggest amount of problems in Syria. It's not going to be easy. but for how long the United States will wait until they make actions. Before we ask our panel to answer, and, and thank you for the question you've asked, Art, do you um, believe that by intervening, the United States should intervene in a decisive way on its own militarily, or are you talking about arming the Syrian rebel groups? Well, uh, as a start, I want to make it lo I mean, loud and clear for everybody that we don't want to see any American get hurt in Syria, just like it happened in Iraq for no reasons. Uh, we, we are asking for no flight zones and arming moderate uh, free Syrian army rebels that they prove that they are fighting both of the Assad regime and the extremist militias from Iran and, and Hezbollah 
and also the ISIS in northern of, of Syria, and this is uh, known for everybody uh, in the world. So uh, I believe uh, arming the rebels and making no flight zones, at least taking down uh, Bashar al-Assad's ability to use explosive barrels that he killed over 45,000 people within three months, and using uh, his ability to use uh, MiG fighters will solve a lot of problems and would it will make millions of Syrians safe in their houses. So I don't know uh, for how long uh, you're going to wait. Thank you very much for your Where question. Where did you come from? From a small town in the west suburbs of Damascus called Muaddamiya. It was struck with chemical weapons in 21-8. Uh, we survived starvation for 15 months. The Assad regime blockaded all uh, supplies of life, uh, daily uh, shelling and bombardment. I watched dozens of people starving to death, uh, killed by sarin gas. Personally, my heart stopped for three minutes at 21.8, and it was uh, an absolute miracle for me to come back alive and maybe standing uh, in front of you right now and speak about what's happening in Syria. I know a lot of good friends of mine who turned into, uh, I don't know, maybe extremist jihadis or this kind of groups because they felt that we are left alone. Most of them were college students, doctors, or studying for law school. Uh, they used to have uh, passion about life, and after they felt that they have they've been left alone to face this ugly destiny, uh, they turn into going uh, fighting with extremist groups because they are well trained and uh, well financed, and they are fighting Bashar al-Assad. Mm -hmm. So I believe the longer that you will wait, uh, it will only make things even more complicated. Thank you. How do you, that's a very profound series yeah. of observations, very yeah. disturbing observations, obviously, about what's happened. How do you all react to it? I think that, you know, this person's story is also, is a meaning that uh, in such a time that think, I just can listen. And because uh, to start now to give political uh, answer that we try to do in the last hour, mm. it would be a uh, right weaker than his uh, life story now. So I hope that there will come a day and the situation on the ground will be changed. Take into consideration that the all groups which are fighting against Assad are totally split from each other and it's very difficult they are not united, and it's, one, it's also one of the main problems how to help them. But I think that uh, after what we hear from you, I just uh, say my sim sympathy to you and to your people, and I hope that uh, this period of time will be as short as possible. This can offend you for a moment, mm. I think. Thank you. I, I, I just Thank you. Uh, my reaction is it's a very um, important reminder we have four cases here. In the case of Ben Ali and the case of Mubarak, they left. Without a war, they left uh, power. I mean, Mubarak is still is in prison. But um, in the other two cases, Gaddafi and Assad, they said, I'm not leaving, I'm killing. And for various reasons, we and others in NATO decided we're going to get rid of Gaddafi. Uh, but we didn't decide that in the case of Assad. And so you have this horrendous humanitarian situation that, that uh, we've been talking about. Sean. Nothing more to add. Thank you very much for your question. Ladies and gentlemen, it's 8.20. We can't keep you here much longer, but we have at least four people who want to ask questions. What I'd suggest is we try in 10 minutes to get four questions asked and four answered. And that, may, that might mean that maybe I'll just ask one of the panelists mm. to answer the question, because um, you've all been very patient, and we'll go right to you. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and my question is regarding if Assad is forced out of power, um, how can we strategize before that happens? Uh, who is going to fill that power vacuum? Because a lot of the discussion has been Assad needs to go, and I think that's the general consensus. Nothing good comes with him in power. But there are a lot of bad alternatives to him as well who could uh, fill that power vacuum. That's a great question. Yeah. Who should answer that question on this panel? <laughs> Elliot. <laughs> okay. Um, this is one reason why I think the United States should be supporting Syrian 
rebel group. Because in the aftermath of an Assad departure, there's going to be a fight for power. And those are the people we would like to see, frankly, uh, Sunni, non-jihadi, Syrian rebel group in a better position um, in that post-Assad uh, struggle. Um, I don't know if there's anything more we can do than to try to promote those groups. And the more influence we have with them, because we've worked with them for X months, the more likely it is we'll be able to say to them, um, you, you know, you cannot go murder Alawis now to try to get back. You cannot do this and that. You should let us help you start writing a constitution. Let us, uh, I think that, that that's a reason to be involved so that we'll have more influence after. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, I think I'm going to direct my question to Mr. Elliot immediately. Um, as a follow-up to your cross, uh, to yeah, my colleague's question, uh, don't you believe that uh, the case in Syria is more of a free-for-all rather than like a multi like two clear-cut fronts fighting each other? Uh, you said like uh, to support Sunni non-jihadi groups, uh, Syrian non-jihadi groups, and that means uh, that leaves. Kurdish, uh, Shi'i, um, Jabhat al-Nusra, ISIS, the Islamic Front, troops, uh, paramilitary militias out of the question and they don't all like adhere directly to Assad. So in the case of a premature removal of uh, Assad himself as a figure, don't you believe that it will plunge into more immediate chaos as the troops will might eventually split up into other forms of factions? And if we just rem remember what uh, Faris al Khouri said, like back in 1920s in Syria, that the French have come to save the Christians. So he went up to uh, the Amayyad mosque and said that I am, as a Christian, say to the French that from here I testify that there is no God but Allah. So don't you think, as, what you, as you said before, that if the UN forms a coalition to protect the Alawi minority, it would be sort of as a step to redivide Syria, the same thing the French have attempted into mm -hmm. an Alawite state and a majority Sunni state. Well, you know, we could have a two-hour discussion of this. It's a great question. It's going to be a one-minute discussion. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. Um, I, I think that one of the reasons for these divisions, as the gentleman from Syria said, is those who were not, those who were anti-Assad when he chose war and murder had nowhere to turn because we were not there. We and the Turks and the Jordanians and the others were not saying, we'll help you because he's a mass murderer, he's got to go. We gave speeches, we didn't give arms. I think that if we were there, and the we is not the United States, it's this coalition. If we were there, I think there would be fewer people going to the jihadi groups, and I think we'd have a much better chance of avoiding the kind of uh, fractionation that is continuing to take place. I think, can I, again, it may be wrong. And one of the things we'll have to reflect on in the United States and in Europe, especially in the Arab world, did we just wait too long? One of the things we do here at the Kennedy School, yeah. can we learn the lessons? There were options in 2011 and 12 that have right. disappeared. And so you do have to go through that analytical yeah. exercise. Yes, we have two questions. Yes. Thank you very much for all of your insights. And uh, I want to salute my uh, friend Jose for uh, his um, grave uh, testimony. And I uh, would like to make a, a comment about uh, the discussion that's been circulating about the jihadi groups and whether U.S. inaction uh, is the right way to prevent these jihadi groups from coming to power in Syria. And uh, to, to make an acknowledgment, I, we would like to see an acknowledgment that inaction is a decision as well. It's not absolving us of the consequences of uh, these jihadi groups coming to power. And the reality in Syria is that uh, the longer that U.S. or other Western-aligned powers are not involved in Syria, the higher the chances of these jihadi groups. And there are a few different uh, important indicators of this. First of all, according to Israeli intelligence in a Washington Post article in January of this year, the majority of foreign fighters in Syria are fighting with the regime not against the regime in Syria. The regime in Syria is the core problem that invites extremism into Syria. This is number one. Number two. So what, what question would you have for this panel? 
based, uh, on, based on you know your sentiment. The yeah, your whether opinion. whether or not there can be an acknowledgement that we cannot address the extremist issue until we get rid of the Assad regime, which is calling all, causing all of these extremist problems, and the fact that inaction on behalf of the United States will only further our extremist problem down the line. Thank you. So inaction is a decision. So inaction is a decision. I agree <coughs> with that. But I will say that there, there is a complexion here that, that we have to talk about. And, and one piece of this is what can you do to stop what's going on in Syria right now? That's one piece of this, OK, to make people keep fighting. But what I was trying to say is that um, the, the willingness for people to get into the fight uh, is a decision that comes from many things. It is stirring emotion on, a lo on, on many, many fronts. The humanitarian piece is one of, one of the fronts. So if you looked at only that and you saw images of people who were starving and that were in refugee camps and were, as humans, they need to do something, you have to come up with a counteraction to that action that the extremists are using on their screens to show you to come, to come fight. Foreign fighters are coming because they're emotionally pulled, not just from the politics, but because of their draw into a narrative that says you need to help another, your fellow Muslims, and look, they're, they're, they're suffering. So a, a counteraction is one, one way to do that, and that is actually action. And that can happen in ways big and small, uh, online and offline, that don't require a lot of money, by the way. It requires a recalibration in the way in which we think about the sophistication of the narrative. And, and, and that has not, to my, to my understanding, been done in the way it should be. So you are seeing, for example, uh, in the UK, uh, former Arsenal football players who are leaving the UK and, and going to fight and making videos that are recruiting others to come. I mean, that's amazing. You're seeing, for example, in the UK, I mean, this we didn't even talk about, um, women are leaving to fight, to not to fight, to go be uh, part of the, the movement uh, of foreign fighters so that they can be supportive and they can be drawn in and have temporary marriages with the jihadi fighters. This is a very complex situation that, 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 is, un that is unfolding, it has unfolded. So it isn't just what can we do to stop what's happening in Syria, which is very important, but there is a long tail to this uh, as well. You have the last question. <laughs> um, my name is Philip Gardner. I'm a graduate student in the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, we spoke about the uh, red lines and the damage that might do to both the credibility of President Obama and the United States. Um, I want to take us back, I believe, to 2011 when Barack Obama started the Atrocities Prevention Board and said that this would be a part of his national security calculus and when to act. Does it not make a mockery of the values that he said brought about the creation of that board for him to then stand by and watch the massacre that we've been discussing this evening? Abu? I think that, you know, one has to look three, four steps forward. And what your colleague said, for instance, before, so, you know, let's uh, put aside as a Assad aside, and later on we'll see what will happen. And I think that uh, according to the, the American president presentation and declaration, he really mm -hmm. wanted and believed it. But I said before, uh, the Middle East, it's a very complicated area. And saying that you are strongly depend on the values and that it, and without understanding the whole complexity of the region, it sometimes bring you to real terrible mistakes, in my opinion, what had happened in Egypt was an American mistake, and even now. You mean to disavow President Mubarak? Yeah, and later on, the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood uh, came into power in Egypt, and now still the relationship between uh, the current regime and the United States, it's not so well in this very moment. And I think that you have to look at the, uh, what I feel that this administration has not, uh, I call a whole strategy to the region. 
And in the moment that you don't have the whole strategy and you try and one step forward and two step backward, so, and uh, it's complicated, it's true. But I think that uh, you asked me about probability and this is the most dangerous thing because there is no, there is, America is the only superpower in the world with all my respect to Mr. Putin and the others, but America is the only superpower. And if the only police in this world is not uh, doing its job, so there are problems. On that very alarming, <laughs> somber <laughs> note, we're going to bring this to a close. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank everyone who asked the question. They were good, intelligent, tough questions. I want to thank Farah, Elliot, Abu. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.